warmly welcome to Lund University, celebrating 350 years. Uh, my name is Karen Agastam. I'm a professor, Pufendorf professor in political science here at Lund University and also visiting professor at Monash University. The establishment of the university, I should remember, took place against the background of a serial of wars that had taken place in the 17th century. And as part of that endeavor of establishing Lund University as a leading international institution, it recruited the great German political philosopher, historian and economist Samuel Pufendorf uh, from Germany. And so he was one of the first professors at Lund University. During his time, Samuel Pufendorf articulated his ideas about law of nations, which lay the foundation of international law. This foundation and his ideas about international law was based on his strong conviction that the true state of nature for all human beings is a peaceful one. For this, at this time, particular time, historic time, he took a number of academic strives. What Samuel Pufendorf also underlined, however, was that peace may be weak and uncertain, which is why we need a law of nations. Now, this complexity of his reasoning at the time and his timeless legacy bears strong, I would say, relevance today when we confront some major challenges regarding war and peace in contemporary global politics. And also this symposium today builds on that legacy, focusing on the quest for a peaceful global order. More specifically, this symposium zooms in on gender justice and peace diplomacy. Now, a peaceful global order is of a vital concern for us all. Yet, in the sphere of diplomacy and peace negotiations, women are still grossly underrepresented. At the same time, there are also indications that this picture is changing. We have the landmark resolution, UN Resolution 1325, endorsed in year 2000, which really provides a significant milestone in the quest for inclusive representation and participation in peace processes. So this symposium seeks to probe these conundrum and questions. Where are the women? How is gender related to the decline of armed conflicts? And which paths can be taken towards a more inclusive and gender just diplomacy? To respond to these queries, we have, I would say, one of the most distinguished and preeminent experts, scholars, politicians, and leaders in this field. To meet these global challenges and struggles for gender justice and peace, you do need courage, you need leadership, and you need visionary thinking. Now, Lund University is deeply honored I'm very privileged to have as the keynote speaker the Swedish Foreign Minister, Margot Wallström. There are today a number of so-called women-friendly states that are pursuing the quest of gender equality in international relations. But Sweden is actually the first country in the world who has taken one step further by declaring that it's pursuing a feminist foreign policy. Moreover, as part of that platform, gender and peace diplomacy is core and central of that policy. I would also argue that this resonates strongly in academia, where many scholars actually see this now as a window of opportunity to engage uh, with the policy community uh, in a critical dialogue around feminism, around gender, about peace and international relations. 
So it's a fantastic opportunity to bridge theory and practice as well, which is something that we really strive for. Again, it's a great honor to have the Swedish Foreign Minister here to get today to deliver the keynote speech uh, titled A Feminist Foreign Policy and Diplomacy as a Tool for Peace and Gender Equality. Welcome, Margot Wallström. Thank you very much, and I have to admit that I've become a bit sentimental coming back to Lund and to meet with uh, students again. Uh, and this environment is um, fantastic, as our guests have already noticed. It's a privilege to, um, to have served on the board of Lund University, and it's a privilege to be invited to come again. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, dear students, is the world becoming a better place? That's one of the questions being asked uh, during all the seminars at Lund University celebrating its 350th anniversary. So let me first say warm congratulations uh, and let me assure you that I'm, I'm always very happy to, to be back here. And I'm sure that this question is the world becoming a better place, has been discussed by generations of students while walking the streets and parks of Lund. And throughout history, the answer has been both yes and no. Just like in 2017, rapid progress has gone hand in hand with setbacks. Today, we are faced with several protracted conflicts, the continued scourge of terrorism, systematic sexual and gender-based violence, and the largest refugee crisis in modern history. It is clear that the international system has failed in its core task of ensuring peace and security for all, and the world needs to change its approach. Adhering to the status quo is not an option. In order to break the status quo and make the world a better place, we need gender equality. The fantastic phrase, women's rights are human rights, must become the spine of all our political work. I am the foreign minister of the world's first officially feminist government, consisting of 12 men and 12 women. And since my government assumed office two years ago, I have pursued a feminist foreign policy. And in this way, we are trying to shift our focus from response to prevention, and we are changing our approach from reactive to proactive. And prevention can never be successful without a proper analysis of how situations and developments affect men, women, boys and girls differently. So friends, allow me to continue by describing what our feminist foreign policy is, how we apply it and what difference it has made so far. The concluding section will provide some very practical examples of how we use diplomacy as a tool for peace and gender equality. So when describing a feminist foreign policy, it is useful to start with the three fundamental R's, rights, representation and resources because rights are at the core of our policy. As I said, human rights are also women's rights. And the fact that such a simple statement still causes so much controversy is just one more proof of how much a feminist foreign policy is needed. When it comes to the second R, representation, we start by asking a simple question, where are the women? Who makes decisions? Whether in foreign or domestic policy or economic decision-making, we see that women are chronically underrepresented in positions of influence. Resources uh, refer to the need to apply a gender perspective, also when distributing aid or other resources. If you want to understand why women and men are treated differently worldwide, you should, as the saying goes, follow the money. Are women in charge of their own economic situation and their own resources? 
For example, in 2014, humanitarian funding for UN-wide uh, crisis response totaled more than 9 billion US dollars, but only 4% of projects were gender specific. And this needs to, to change. The three R's uh, that symbolize or are the, the tools and the approach of a feminist foreign policy are anchored in the fourth one, reality. Reality is about getting facts and analysis right from the outset. What does the situation on the ground look like if we include 100% of the population? And in this time of misinformation and uh, campaigns and alternative facts, uh, the need to base policies on knowledge and experience is perhaps greater than ever. The second question that must be asked is how the feminist foreign policy is applied. In practice, our feminist foreign policy means that we apply a systematic gender perspective in everything we do, we use our foreign policy tools to promote gender equality, and we use gender equality to advance our foreign policy objectives. So how do we do it within the Swedish Foreign Service? Well, let me highlight four operational ingredients. The first uh, is about leadership. And um, I tried to, uh, to show leadership uh, when um, I took office in October 2014 and proclaimed a feminist foreign policy. That creates expectations, of course, and also accountability. Um, this is, of course, a necessary condition, but it is not enough. Leadership is needed at all levels at the, uh, the ministry. And I have made it crystal clear to all heads of department that they are responsible for the gender mainstreaming of their own and their staff's work and workplace. The second um, element is ownership. Um, two months after the launch of a feminist foreign policy, we sent a letter to all parts of the foreign service, um, meaning all embassies, uh, and our representation, outlining our strategic thinking and inviting everyone from Copenhagen to Kabul uh, to get back to us with their reflection and input. And this was a key step, a policy that had been introduced top-down uh, now became homegrown. And this also spurred colle colleagues from different uh, policy areas and geographical locations to discuss gender equality and also increase their understanding of possibilities for action. And the reports from these discussions, I think, gave us a solid base as we continue to develop and operationalize um, our policy. And it is essential for all parts of, of my organization to have a feeling of ownership in this new policy, such as the feminist foreign policy, to continue over time. And I must say it was um, impressive the way the embassies reported back home to headquarters, uh, putting those glasses on, the gender lenses on, and saying, well, suddenly we started to ask, but how many girls are married before the age of 18? And how does that affect the economic development in a, in a certain country? Or suddenly we discovered this or that phenomenon in, in society in a way that we have never really looked at be before. The third element after leadership and ownership is really direction. And the suggestions from colleagues all over the world were channeled into our first action plan. Um, and that was launched in November 2015. And that action plan outlined our work, outlining the hows and what, whos and whats. And it includes six long-term goals and yearly focus areas reflecting the most uh, pressing challenges. And the action plan has now been incorporated into the Foreign Services uh, operational plan. And that means that work on gender mainstreaming is followed up and measured in our regular processes within all the ministry's activities. And as you know, this is crucial to keep momentum in, a, in any large bureaucracy. The yearly process enables us to learn and benefit from conclusions and um, new data. And 
if you want to have a look at the action plan, you can uh, access it on the website of the Swedish government. The fourth element is support. If gender mainstreaming is everyone's responsibility, a focal point function is also necessary. And we therefore have an ambassador for gender equality who is also the coordinator of the feminist foreign policy. And the ambassador and her team, they coordinate the development and follow up of the action plan. They develop support material, including e-learning. And they collect and disseminate uh, good practices, uh, connect across policy areas and contribute to developing policy, communication and incentive structures as well. For instance, we have now uh, uh, an award, a regional uh, diploma to an embassy that has implemented the policy in a particularly outstanding way. So we try to encourage those that really are um, uh, at the, on the front line. Moreover, the ambassador also has a specific point of contact among the advisors in my office in order to facilitate all important procedures. So, uh, talking about methods and ways of implementation is one thing. The main question, and the third question here, is what difference a feminist foreign policy has made so far. And, of course, it is not a very long, uh, long time that we've had. It's just uh, a little more than over uh, two years to, uh, to implement something that is a complete change of, of um, approach, I would say. But the overall result um, has been a cultural shift within our foreign service uh, as an organization. And I am proud to say that it has generated also important outcomes. Our efforts have contributed to some 20 countries drawing up laws and proposals to strengthen gender equality, um, to hundreds of thousands of women and girls avoiding unsafe abortions and unwanted pregnancies, pregnancies and to some 90 local communities abandoning the practice of female genital mutilation. On rights, we are proud that our chairmanship to the Call uh, to Action initiative has helped to increase the number of partners. So we are now 66 states and organizations having made more than 265 commitments to uh, prevent and respond to gender-based violence in emergencies. And of course this is important in particular, in particular now that we have such flows of, of uh, migrants and, and refugees. Regarding representation, we have promoted women as actors in peacemaking through um, the provision of resources, uh, <clears throat> connections, capacity building and advisory support from our Swedish network of women mediators. And when it comes to resources, the Swedish government is uh, providing substantive uh, support to promote gender equality and women's and girls' full enjoyment of human rights. Uh, as an example, a gender equality perspective should be integrated in all assistance provided by the Swedish International Development uh, Corporation Agency, SIDA. So, after um, this overview of our, our feminist foreign policy, um, I would like to describe more specifically how we are strengthening Sweden's capacity to contribute to inclusive and sustainable peace processes. First of all, a support function for dialogue and peace processes has been established at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Stockholm. Uh, moreover, a handful of embassies in conflict areas will receive uh, extra support. And the aim is, of course, to strengthen Sweden's involvement uh, throughout the conflict cycle and more effectively address the root causes fueling conflicts. The, the modern mediation, and I'm sure you will hear more from the other panelists here, also the modern mediation landscape is multidimensional. We are witnessing a proliferation of actors engaged in uh, inter- and intrastate uh, conflicts. So the nature of war has uh, very much changed. And this affects both when and how Sweden could and should contribute to peace processes. The, the classic solo mediator uh, is less frequently called upon. What we see more often today 
are different forms of partnership with other peacekeeping actors, such as the UN, the European Union, the African Union, OECE, uh, the Red Cross, and not least, the local organizations. And in this way, political, personal, or financial aid is uh, provided. We also need to think creatively about the role of mediator and all the different instruments available. And here are some current examples of available Swedish instruments. We have embassies and development assistance in, in 13 conflict-affected countries, including Colombia, Afghanistan and Somalia. We have special envoys for peace efforts in the Great Lakes region, the Horn of Africa and Syria. We have conflict secured all of our development assistance with a focus on peace building. And a new development strategy for peaceful and inclusive societies is expected to be complete by this summer. And the strategy builds on Sustainable Development Goal 16 and has a special focus on conflict prevention, women, peace and security, as well as rapid support for peace processes. I have taken the initiative to form a Swedish female mediation network, and the network consists of, so far, nine experienced women ready to promote inclusive peace processes and also assist local women peace builders. The mediation network has, for example, contributed to peace efforts in Syria, Burundi, Afghanistan and Somalia. And in Afghanistan, a dialogue and mediation training with local Afghan women peace builders have been particularly successful. And the Swedish network is a component of a Nordic mediation network. And we are now approached by also the African Union, for example, saying that it should also be completed with, uh, with women from that part of, of the world. Uh, there is an image of, of Sweden since a long time back as an, an honest, serious and long-term partner. And that enables us to provide good offices and also to use Sweden as a platform for talks between different parties. And this is um, important knowledge also from some of the ongoing peace processes, like in Colombia, uh, that it was... It was um, uh, an important element to be able to conduct those peace negotiations as it was in, in Cuba uh, over the years. Um, they lost some of the anchoring within Colombia and, and that was a, a setback, but it was also important to be able to take it somewhere else. There was less tension and you didn't have to create special solutions for, for having peace negotiations in, in your own country. Uh, we uh, have also a partnership with a series of mediation organizations, such as Interpeace, Intermediate, the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, the European Institute uh, of Peace, Conciliation Resources, and Crisis Management Initiative uh, that is based in Finland. Swedish organizations, such as the Dag Hammarskjöld Foundation and also CIPRI, the Swedish International Peace Research Institute, often provide unique input and knowledge of individual peace efforts. We should also, well, as I said, we should recognize the lessons learned from peace processes um, in Colombia, the Philippines, Somalia and Liberia, because they are central also to our uh, efforts. Because we know that transparency is a prerequisite for dealing with the causes of conflict and for peace um, to last. A successful peace process is not only a question of a ceasefire for, or a formal agreement between the warring part parties. It is also about justice, reconciliation, reconstruction, education, access to health, political access, and distribution of resources. And a sustainable peace process creates the conditions for stable and legally secure institutions that promote social, economic, and political development for all. Because the experience over time through history has been that even if there is peace, there is rarely peace for women. S sexual violence continues or is even exacerbated. Uh, with new elements uh, to it uh, introduced. And, and women do not in, in, uh, enjoy um, peace in the same way. 
Within the framework of our feminist foreign policy, we will therefore also further develop support for women's meaningful participation in peace efforts before, during and after conflicts. And for me, it is obvious that women must be included equally in all parts of society. When research so clearly shows that gender-equal societies are also less likely to end up in conflict, it is no longer possible to justify why half the population should be excluded from discussions about their own future. And consistently in the Security Council, since we are now a member of, of the Security Council, we, we have to ask, where are the women? Are they in the texts of everything from press statements to resolutions? Are they there as peacekeepers on the ground? Are they there included in any uh, peace agreements? Um, and we will also strengthen our ability to build peace from below. Formal peace processes that exclude either the victims of the conflict or local peace builders have limited opportunities to be sustained over time. By linking processes at local, national and international level, one can lay the foundation for legitimate agreement that takes the root causes of conflict into account. So inclusive peace process is therefore not only an issue of rights, it is also smart, smart policy. So friends, finally, um, when the uh, Universal Decla Declaration of Human Rights was adopted, there were only two women on the Human Rights Commission responsible for drafting the declaration. Many of you know the first one, Eleanor Roosevelt. The other one was Hansa Mehta, an Indian writer and independence activist. When the Commission proposed the phrase, all men are brothers, Hansa Mehta objected. She noted that this could be interpreted in some countries as an opportunity to exclude women. Hansa's insistence on, on incorporating an expression that fully recognized the equality of women and men resulted in the text finally adopted for Article 1 that reads, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Each of you individually and you collectively have a sphere of influence that is within your control at a personal level, in your interaction with others, and in organizations where you might be active. Bringing women into decision-making, applying gender analysis, calling for and collective, collecting gender disaggregated data, these things can be done everywhere, at universities and at foreign ministries. In different ways, we can raise our voices and play a part. Sometimes it takes a hundred years and millions of men and women to change the course of history. Sometimes it takes one person and one moment. Hansa Mehta was just one woman, but she had a seat at the table and her actions ensured that the Declaration on Human Rights became truly universal. And when I look at you, I see a room full of uh, sisters and brothers to Hansa Mehta. And the time, I think, has come for gender equality. Thank you for listening and thank you for everything you are doing. Okay. Thank you very much, Foreign Minister Margot Wallström, for a fascinating, comprehensive and insightful uh, uh, presentation on what is a feminist foreign policy. As a Swede, we often get posed with that question, so it was very, very useful for us to hear in details how you actually try to operationalize it, because it's this question is coming up all the time. So thank you very much. Uh, we will be able to uh, have some questions uh, in the end of the symposium, so Write down your question if you have some. Um. The next speaker uh, is Professor Joshua Goldstein, 
from the American University and the University of Massachusetts. He's a leading scholar in international relations who does not shy away from tackling the big, difficult questions that we're pondering upon today. Uh, he has been uh, probing the uh, problematic of war and gender, which is not only about women, marginalized groups, but it's also as much about men and masculinities. Uh, Professor Joshua Gosan has also taken on the big debates on winning the war on war, uh, and if we indeed see a rise, uh, that peace is on the rise. And this, I would argue, corresponds very well with the overarching theme during this week, uh, Science Week, which is about, is the world becoming a better place? And I assume, uh, despite the fact that that's a few years ago since you wrote the book, that I assume still the question would, and your answer would be yes to that question, which I think we have to keep sort of the vision and the, the uh, optimism going uh, in these uh, times as well. So we're delighted to have you with us here today, Professor Joshua Goldstein, and to hear you speak on contrasting feminisms in global politics and diplomacy. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if the world is becoming a better place, I think Sweden has a big role uh, in that process. And it was a little sub-theme in my book, Winning the War on War. We, we said the secret subtitle was How the Swedes Are Saving the World. So it's a, I very much appreciate being able to be in this wonderful country and this great university on such an occasion and to be able to follow the distinguished foreign minister. Um, and also that you're willing to speak in English with me and not Swedish, so thank you for that. Um, it's no secret that world politics and diplomacy are a very male-dominated sphere. And here we have the recent Syrian peace negotiations with a whole room full of men talking about the war. The United States president here is cutting off funding for women's health care around the world, surrounded by a room full of men. In the APEC summit meeting in 1997, the male leaders of that summit dressed up in matching bomber jackets for a moment of male bonding. And if we come back 20 years later, this, the picture has changed because Michelle Bachelet is now in there, one woman, and at this rate, uh, the APEC summit meeting will be equal numbers of men and women in only 200 more years. See, the world is getting to be a better place. In today's uniformed state armies, it's about 20 million people, 97% of the uh, soldiers, participants are male, and ab about the same in peacekeeping, although it's beginning to change very slowly. And in designated combat forces, which is several million people, well over 99% are male. Now, all feminists would agree that women have the right to, to participate in these venues, to be represented, and to have access to the resources that come out of these processes. And also to vote, to drive, to own property, divorce, be safe from violence. But now I'm gonna talk about some complex and controversial things that I wanna expand the discussion into, but because time's very short, I'm gonna simplify them. So I apologize for that, and you might not agree with me, uh, but here are some ideas. I'll talk about difference feminism and liberal feminism, two varieties that agree on these basic points, but difference feminists would tend to say that women bring special qualities as women to, let's say, diplomacy, and specifically that women are more peaceful and men are more aggressive, and that these are very fundamental differences between the two genders. Liberal feminists see men and women as very much more similar, um, and that the inclusion of women, in addition to being a rights issue, will bring the other half of the talent pool to the table, so you'll get better outcomes by not excluding people because of their gender. In daily conversation, we often hear men are like this and women are like this. Every day I hear this. Um, and even that men are from Mars, women are from Venus, different species, different down to the cellular level. Um, but when you look at actual gender differences on any particular capability along the horizontal axis and the number of people on the vertical axis, we find bell curves, most people in the middle, and then they're spread out to the sides. And it, in, in most cases, it, other than childbirth, where there really are categorical differences, but on most other dimensions, 
Um, you'll find often little shifts in the averages between the groups, but also a great deal of overlap. And this means that an individual's position on this scale is not determined by their gender. They're men and women along the two sides, but there tend to be average differences. And so liberal feminism tries to overcome the tyranny of averages in which an individual is judged by the average of their group and to uh, judge individuals based on their merit, not their gender. People are diverse on many different dimensions and diversity is good in strengthening an organization such as a, a foreign ministry or military um, negotiations. Uh, but but gender is only one of the categories on which people differ and not necessarily the most important one. I would say it's not the most important one. Um, let me give an example here from a, a difference feminist perspective. Anthropologist Helen Fisher 10 years ago said, men and women did not evolve to have the same brain. We're finding more and more gender differences in the brain. One of them is women's verbal ability. Women can talk. You know, so if you look at the, the data on verbal ability from the American college entrance exams, you find it's true. Women score higher on average than men on this test of verbal ability. But you also find that most people are in the overlap zone and that some men are very verbal, some women not very verbal. You couldn't judge an individual's verbal ability very well just based on their gender. And this is true of other, uh, other capabilities, such as um, harm avoidance or, or risk acceptance. Um, you know, are men more accepting of risk and women avoid harm more? Yes, on average, but most people are in the overlap zone. And basic differences, like how fast people run. Men run faster on average, but uh, a lot of women are faster than almost all the men. Um, height is a... a crucial one to me because I'm way at the end here, not at the average. Um, and there are women who are taller than almost all the men. Well, taller than the average man anyway. And I've met women taller than me, so the individuals uh, differ. And even in upper body strength, which is the, the greatest of the physical gender differences because it's keyed by testosterone in puberty, um, there are women stronger in their upper body strength than men. These data are from the U.S. Army. So the left side of the bell curve has been crunched in because the weaker people are not getting into the Army, whether they're men or women. And also the data are from 1982. So um, in those days, uh, uh, most women were eating and exercising to be thin, and most men were eating and exercising to be strong. And you used to see at the gym the aerobic equipment all occupied by women and the uh, weightlifting all occupied by men, which is not true anymore. Um, I think I'm trying to get updated data here, and I think you would find more overlap now of women having more upper body strength. The point is, even on these, uh, you know, the, the greatest physiological differences, there is some overlap. So again, when you hear men are like this and women are like that, think to yourself, well, on average, but with a lot of overlap, and you can't tell where an individual will fall. Now let me talk about several problems with treating men and women as categorically different when we're thinking about world politics and diplomacy. And the first one is obvious, reinforcing gender stereotypes. When an individual fits a gender stereotype, we tend to attribute their behavior or, or qualities to their gender, such as if a man is violent, it's because he's a man. But if, if an individual doesn't fit, like a man is very gentle and nonviolent, we don't say that's because he's a man. We just say that's an individual. Quality. So it makes it hard because gender stereotypes have a grain of truth, that's the average difference, and then we filter and judge people when they fit the stereotype, but filter out when they don't fit. And stereotypes can be part of old stories that reinforce patriarchy. For instance, women need protection. This is an old, an old story. The UN Security Council Resolution 1325 uses the word protect seven different times to refer to women. And uh, this is practical, and I'm not criticizing it, but I want to think a little bit about it. Valerie Hudson even says that we should extend the idea of R2P, the responsibility to protect civilians, as being R2PW, responsibility to protect women. And the problem I have with it is the message that it means that women are weak, men are strong. So we're, we're reinforcing, and it's not an empowering message about women. 
And it even extends to our discussions of sexual violence in wartime. This is an American anti-Japanese poster from World War II. Um, that women are victims. And we want to pay attention to sexual violence in wartime, for sure. And it's good that we're paying more attention than, than had been the case. But this discourse that women are victims, women are powerless, um, and that violence against women is somehow different than violence against men. I'm a little bit suspicious of it. Men get, uh, I mean, rape is a form of torture, um, and, but is it really that different than a, an electric drill to the skull or the tortures that are inflicted on men in wartime? And men are also sexually tortured in wartime. So I think that when men are tortured and women are tortured in wartime, there's a, a different take on it, possibly because the stereotype is the women are innocent and helpless and the men are somehow compromised by their gender uh, as to their status as victims. Similarly, we hear the phrase, women are the main victims of war. And I don't think this is true. Uh, both genders are victims of war. If anything, more men get killed in war than women do. If you look at here, the number of people is on the horizontal axis and the age is on the vertical axis. This is Russia after World War II, a war that was particularly hard on civilian society, a lot of starvation, a lot of destruction of infrastructure. And you see that the male side is just crushed in. More men died in the war. And this is also true of the war in Syria today. I've heard a number as high as 85% of the fatalities in Syria, men. Um, in Srebrenica in Bosnia, the war criminals separated the population by gender, put the women on buses uh, after taking the ones they wanted to rape and torture, and then killed all the men. And in the iconic dis discourse in international relations, the Thucydides Melian dialogue, Thucydides says the strong do what they will and the weak suffer what they must. And what was it that the strong did and the weak suffered? It was just like Srebrenica, take the women for slavery and rape, kill all the men. Who's the main victim? You know, I don't think it's a useful way to think of it. They're both victims. In uh, violence generally in the world, more than three quarters of the victims of homicide are men and the majority of victims of all violent crime are men. Now, of course, the perpetrators are also men, um, but the victims are men. And in refugee populations, oftentimes the most vulnerable are the men, especially what we call battle-aged men, who just by virtue of their gender and their age are considered to be possibly suitable for military service, even though they may be civilians with no connection to military service. And they're prone to losing their civilian immunity because of that and to be plucked out of a refugee population and either killed or inducted into military service, which may be, amount to the same thing. And, and in this, we have the related concept that you hear, women and children are the majority of refugees. Now, this is true. Most refugee populations, like the populations they're drawn from, are about half children and about half men and women in the adult population. So it's true. Women and children are three quarters of the population of refugees. But it's also true that men and children are the majority of refugees, and yet you never hear this term, men and children. So here we've reinforced a stereotype that women are like children, they're innocent, they're helpless, they're weak. Um, and I think we should suspect that. So that's the problem of reinforcing gender stereotypes. Now, second problem uh, that I have with the difference approach is that it encourages gender segregation. If men and women are on different planets, then of course they'll grow up separately and live in different worlds and not have much interaction with each other. But babies actually start out ungendered. You have to look very hard to see if there's a little bump or a little dimple between the legs, and otherwise they're physiologically the same, and they will stay the same for eight years. Same testosterone levels, same body, same physiology for eight years, and then slowly differentiate into puberty. And yet we put great effort into gendering them from the earliest age. I call it gender apartheid. We have separate colors. It's a boy. First thing you want to know about a baby. What is it, a boy or a girl? Because that's, that's all important. Or it's a girl, pink. Pink, pink, pink. It's like a segment of the electromagnetic spectrum, a little piece of physics that's reserved for one gender. The baby's teeth are identical, but the girl is going to get a... Um, a diamond ring, pink diamond ring, for a sweet baby girl, and the boy gets a power tool for a busy baby boy. 
And so on down through childhood, these examples are from Aaron Chack's hilarious take on BuzzFeed, which you can look up. They need separate candy, separate scotch tape, separate ballpoint pens, separate tools. Girls can use tools as long as they're pink tools. We need separate aisles in the toy stores. Or if you can't decide what to get, just consider a gift card. And out of this, the children grow up in separate play groupings. Now, why do we put so much effort into gendering children this way? And my theory about it is that this is all because we use men to fight wars. Because war is gendered, that's why childhood is gendered the way it is. We're preparing young men, young boys, to become men who might need to fight wars someday. And the clue is in these separate play groups. When a girl crosses to the boy play group, dresses like a boy, cuts her hair short, climbs trees, plays with the boys, she's called a tomboy, my daughter was one, and it's okay. Everybody's cool about that. But if a boy crosses to the girl side and plays with dolls and wears dresses and like that, that's not okay. And that boy is likely to be, oh, well, it's changing a little bit now in some places, but likely to be stigmatized and bullied for that. And that's because the boy is deserting from this path that could lead to military service in the future. And worse yet, might be setting an example for other boys who decide they like dolls better than trucks and so forth. So we, we crack down hard on that. So I don't think we fight wars because men are violent. I think we make men, encourage men's violence and track them into it because we use men to fight wars. And this brings us to the important topic of men, which I always like to talk about. I want to say that my great frustration in gender studies and international relations and, and is that gender is equated with women, and we seldom hear about men. Men don't have gender. Men certainly don't want to talk about gender. On page one of my book, War and Gender, I say that it has to do with both men and women, but somewhat more about men, because it's about war and men are the ones we're gonna use for fighting wars. And yet, when I got an award from my university for this book, it referred to my contributions to studying women and war. It's just like the men are invisible. Um, and we have to get men into the picture. So this brings me to my third problem with difference feminism, which is the, the problem of treating men as static Uniform, missing that whole bell curve, and mostly negative, rather than ever-changing, diverse, and mostly positive, which is how I see men. Uh, it misses some of the nuance and complexity of men and masculinity. And there can be a discourse emerging of denigrating men. Men are bad, men need women to civilize them. This is also an old story, and you see the connection to the, to the issue of women needing protection. Men are also portrayed as naturally promiscuous and irresponsible. And this is even attributed to evolution, that men can create a baby in minutes, but women take nine months, so women are more invested in uh, caring for offspring and so forth. It doesn't add up, because it actually takes 20 years to raise a baby to reproductive age, you know, a whole generation. And having a lot of babies who starve and don't reproduce is not going to pass along your genes. There's two limiting factors. One is how many babies you make, and the other is how many of them survive to have their own babies. Now, if all the babies survived, the, a single couple would lead to a population of 10 billion people in less than 300 years. So the fact that it took millions of years shows you that that's not the limit. The limit is that they don't survive. The limit is raising... Um, investing in your offspring so that they survive, and men, therefore, would get their reproductive advantage and pass along their genes by investing in their children, just like women, right? Not by going around like James Bond, um, having a lot of babies with different women. So all these stereotypes that men are bad, violent, irresponsible, I don't think they hold up. And the reality is men are diverse um, and, and changing through time. First of all, gay men are often omitted from this whole Mars-Venus story. They just don't quite fit. Transgender people are not only omitted, but they illustrate how fluid gender really is. I can't change my age, height, race, and these things, but you can actually change your gender from one to the other, um, which is remarkable. And the norms around masculinity and what we consider to be manly 
are also diverse and fluid through time. Take Louis XIV, the great war-making king. Here he is in a particularly manly pose, the long hair, the flowing purple robes, the legs, the heels. This is a manly man of his time. Ramses II was another great maker of war. Here in his you know, slender build, the long dress, the love of horses, these are all manly. And then we can look at the evolution of the American action figure, G.I. Joe. In the 1960s, the ideal man was a slouchy guy with a rifle who got drafted and took up his duty to serve his country. But by the 1990s, with post-draft, all-volunteer military, emphasis on special forces, now the ideal man was G.I. Joe steroids, as they call him. And women have been able to stretch into men's roles more easily than men into women's roles, as I mentioned with tomboys. During the Vietnam War, we had the iconic image of a woman holding the baby and the gun, representing women's liberation. You can do both sides. But Cynthia Enlow asked in 1983, where is the picture of the male gorilla holding the rifle and the baby? I thought she was so smart. Um, if we wait long enough, 30 years later in Aleppo, here we have him, you know, he's finally there. And he went right onto the front cover of my international relations textbook, the man with the baby and the gun. So the point is, men and masculinity are diverse and changeable. I would also dispute the idea that men are naturally violent or warlike or enjoy fighting, although certainly there are some who do. But on the contrary, societies go to great lengths to turn men into fighters. If it came naturally, we wouldn't need the draft, which in the, I know in Sweden, it's you know, both genders now, but in the United States, it's still, I just saw this in the post office, men do the right thing. It's quick, it's easy, it's the law, you know. It's the law, you have to, to uh, register for the draft. And most societies do conscript in wartime um, because these men are not so violent and warlike that they just join up for the fun of it. And we start early preparing our sons to be soldiers in childhood, toughening up boys. Most societies in the world have rights of adolescent uh, becoming a man um, in which boys have to show bravery and strength such as they would need in uh, wartime, such as this boy in Vanuatu who has to leap off a high platform with just these vines to keep him from crushing his skull. Once in the military, we strip away men's individuality and create conformity with uniforms and haircuts, as Stephen Colbert showed us in Iraq a decade ago. And then we give soldiers drugs, uh, rum ration in the British Army and so forth, to get them able to fight. Another way we get men to fight is by offering sexual rewards to the martyrs of battle. We know about the 72 virgins and all that uh, controversial story. Um, but here's a, a poster in Harvard Library of a World War I casualty being lifted up to heaven in the arms of a half-naked woman. And if soldiers survive, then many cultures promise access to females, uh, some particularly warlike societies require a man to fight or kill in war before being allowed to marry. Most societies give medals or other symbols of gratitude for the sacrifice of men in fighting wars. And despite all these incentives to get men to fight, many men in history have returned from war traumatized. And in the United States right now, we have several hundred thousand of them. Uh, it's just a huge problem and, and heartbreaking. And I wrote about this in a recent book called The Wounds Within with a psychotherapist friend. The point is, fighting and being violent does not come naturally to men. Men are not innately violent. So when we think about gender in world politics and peace and diplomacy, let's think about more than protecting innocent women from violent men, although you want to do that, and about more than getting women represented in military and peacekeeping forces and diplomacy, although that's also very important. Let's imagine healing men from a lifetime of preparing or actually fighting wars. And let's imagine liberating women and men from the tyranny of gender roles, encouraging men to embrace childcare, not as a duty, but as a joy, and encouraging women to participate in military and diplomatic spheres, not because they're women, but because they're highly qualified individuals. Let's imagine building our institutions and practices around diversity of leadership and membership, together strengthening the whole by drawing on that whole bell curve, both bell curves, all the individuals with all that they bring to those institutions and processes. And let's judge individuals on their merit, 
not on their gender. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Yosha Goldstein, for challenging our uh, gender stereotypes and trying to avoid the essentialization that we actually do see uh, at times in this field, but also providing us with an optimistic note uh, in the end of how we can envision uh, an alternative future. Now, uh, I would like to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Tanya Paffenholz. Uh, from an uh, inclusive peace and transition initiative at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Dr. Paffenholz is very well known in the academic community. She has been a, s contributing to the scholarly community for several decades on peace building, on work, on civil society, on inclusiveness. But what makes uh, Tanya uh, Paffenholz quite unique in this regard is also her engagement with policymakers. So she's a very good example, I would say, a striking example of trying to bridge between theory and practice. So her commitment to engage beyond academia is highly impressive. And also her recent study together with her team in Geneva, making women count, not only counting women, has also had a big impact because it also relates to the quest of sustainable peace, which is by the end of the day, the driving force here. So uh, I would like to ask uh, Tanya Paffenholz to come here and we're delighted and thrilled to have you to speak on how we can make women count more in peace processes. Thank you very much for the invitation, 350 years. This is very impressive and I think also it's very nice to be here in this beautiful building and I think everybody who's a student here should really enjoy it to study in such a historical environment. And I'm also very happy to be here to um, talk about women. Now, as I've heard so much about gender, I feel almost like guilty not talking about men. And uh, I would have loved to instantly engage with Joshua on a, on a discussion on how stereotypes and gender are used in mediation. Maybe we come to that in the, in the discussion, both actually positively and negatively. Um, what I want to talk about is really the question, is the world a better place when there are more women involved in peacemaking? And I would like to really make a question mark because I would like into the evidence. So what do we have in terms of evidence? What makes, is it really that simple to say there's more women, there's more peace? Um, what are the, what's the evidence we have? And uh, what does it mean also for a Swedish foreign policy? That is a feminist foreign policy, as we heard quite impressively. And I think it was also very helpful to me to hear that from you, uh, what really makes the implementation of it and what can we contribute from the research community to help you implement this agenda? Um, is the question, where are the women, the right question? I mean, you can say yes, of course, because we have heard all this, there's a rights-based approach to it, there's a gender approach to it, you have all sorts of arguments. But what we actually found in our research was, um, it's not really the right question, in the sense that, we have found so many peace processes where you had actually a quite good amount of, of women present, but there was no difference. And when we first did the study that um, you co just quoted, we were actually asked by you and women for the global study to contribute with data. And I'm not a gender expert, I can, and can say so. I know by now I think a lot about women. And um, we have a big data set on a lot of peace processes, more than 40, and we have looked into what has worked, what has not worked for all actors involved, basically um, looking into different groups of actors. And then we've been asked, like, can you isolate the women and study what they have contributed? And of course, the assumption was that the outcome is like um, more women, more peace, and then to show it in more detail how this peace looks like. So the first run of our data, which is all qualitative data, very in-depth, looking into all these processes, what women have done, was there was no difference. 
there were more women, there were less women, there was no correlation between whether there were more agreements reached or this. So we thought, like, this is really a pity. <laughs> But what can you do? That's the evidence. So as a researcher, you have not a normative agenda, you just have data. So, but I thought, like, let's not give up. Let's dig deeper. Maybe we find something. And then what we found was really interesting. What we found is the more women had influence on the peacemaking process, suddenly you had a much higher rate of peace agreements reached and even higher implementation. So we thought, like, how, how, how come? What does this influence mean? And that was really striking that we suddenly saw what was the discussion that was going on in sort of the literature and the academic world. And what we found in the academic world was a lot of counting. So and so many women at the table, so and so many this, so and so many this. One woman at the table, higher likelihood of certain percent of finding this. And you think, really? One woman makes this. So what we found is basically, it's not like that. First of all, Women are at the table, yes, but are they also making decisions? Like what you said. And what we found is, for example, you have very often the discussion is, let's have more women in the delegations of the conflict parties. You showed the picture of Syria, hardly any. Yes, but what we found is when we had delegations, like in the Nepali constitution negotiations, by the way, there were a lot of women in the delegation. They had a quota. We had them in Yemen. And when you study those, you see suddenly that mostly the women involved are following the party line. So it's exactly like you said, they're not there because of their gender, they're there because they are politicians. And they follow the line of the party. So by thinking you include women, you not necessarily include women and get women politics and some differences. Because they're very equal, like men, and on top of it, they usually even feel more pressure to behave like men, and because to behave like as a party disciplinary person. So what we found is, on the contrary, and that was really interesting, when you have women-only delegations, like you had in Northern Ireland, suddenly you get the women activists in, and they say, we want, we want, we want. And this has a much greater effect on having just more women. So it's really the nitty-gritty details of what we push. What we found, for example, um, women are often pushed in observer status roles. You see also now very popular women advisory bodies, like we have in Syria. And uh, the UN starts setting up more women advisory bodies. And uh, we cannot say at the moment, it would be not doing justice to the instrument to say it hasn't worked. But we can say, so far, the record is not very telling in that sense that you can ask women, and very often we find women in consultative bodies, and then the mediators can say, we've asked them. It's so important. And that's also a change we see in the policy world. The normative pressure from 3025 is really working. People in high-level peacemaking feel obliged to tackle the women question. Not gender, women. And they think about, like, how many do we have so that the Swedes stop talking and the Swedes stop pushing us? And the Swedes stop pushing the Security Council and the Swedes still fund the UN and so. You have an impact, but you can have more. I'll tell you later. <laughs> because, <laughs> because often what we see is that then governments who have an agenda of pushing for inclusion and gender, they are not tough enough, in my view. In that sense that, oh, yes, there's a women advisory body. This is nice. The women are heard. Let's consult them. But it doesn't tell you anything whether they have access to decision making. So why not having them at the table? Why not having a women's only delegation? Why not having consultative bodies that have an influence? So, there's, so we found a lot of means of how women and all the other people actually, also civil society and other groups, can have an influence. For example, when you have a consultative body, you had one in Kenya that um, was set up, it's set up by itself. But Kofi Annan and Kwasa Machel, as mediators, every day consulted them because the two parties, they didn't want to have a consultative body. So the mediators just went to them and every day said, what is it, what do you want? But they were smart. They made proposals very concrete and handed them over. And that's what we said. When these proposals were handed over very concretely, they had an impact. While in Colombia, you have the Victims Forum, 60% of women. It's also a very interesting story. How did the 60% of women come? It was actually the UN, one person in the UN said, like, the statistics, he, ha he hasn't read your book. So he thought women were overproportional victims of war. 
So he basically said, why not having 100% women in the victim forum? An outcry. 100% women? Are you completely insane? And that was really interesting because the whole discussion then turned into how many percentage? And they ended up with 60. So I always tell the women, like, all the women groups I know, they lobby for 30 or 35%. I said, lobby for 80. They will all hate you, but they give you 50. So this is what you can do more, for example. Push the women, push them. And, and this is really, it's really interesting. Nobody ever knows. We try to really trace that, where the 30% come from. That so many groups say, we want 30% or 35%. There's no tracing. There's no, it, it just doesn't make sense. It seems to be the, the most that is perceived that men can take. It, it must be something like that. So what we see is, if women are involved, and I would like to mention also another, even if it sounds technical, commissions. How are peace agreements implemented? They are implemented in all sorts of implementation commissions. And what we found very interesting, in the mediation community, nobody looks into these implementation commissions because they are after. We're only interested in the, in the big deal that is in TV, and, and then we are also interested in gender provisions. We don't look what else women do. It's about gender provisions, as if women are only there to put in women or gender provisions and peace agreements. If we see these commissions inclusive, and this is really in an overarching thing, inclusive by gender, by geographical, by, re by religion, by ethnic proportion, we had that in Liberia or Kenya, for example, then you see these commissions functioning much better and really contributing to a much more sustainable implementation of peace agreements. But we also found if these provisions for inclusions are not set already in the beginning in the peace agreement, it never happens. We screened agreements for like what is meant to be inclusive after the war. And it's really interesting that most peace agreements have actually a clause that says it should be inclusive somehow. But it doesn't, it doesn't, it's never implemented usually. And that's also something what we find is, especially those things that women and civil society lobby for, are, are not very often implemented. Because there's not so much monitoring. Another thing you can link to your foreign policy, invest in monitoring. Both official monitoring, but also monitoring by women and by civil society groups. Because the gains that are achieved need to be sustained. If it's not monitored, it's not sustained. But I would like to mention also, so those women that now sit, for example, we just have finalized a big project for the mediation unit of uh, the UN looking into national dialogues. We studied 20 national dialogues, and for example, we found that most decision-making bodies are very male-dominated, while you have very inclusive setups with a lot of women usually represented. But who makes all the decisions? It's either, it's usually, the usual male leaders, but interestingly, they make these decisions either formally inside the dialogues, but mostly outside the dialogues. So you can discuss whatever you want, it's representative, but the power is outside. And it's very interesting that the mediation community is pretty ignorant to the dimension of power, which is very interesting because you think like diplomacy, power is very interlinked, but power is not a very studied subject and not very looked at also when it comes to these processes. We look very much into the formalities and not where the real power is. And I think this is another thing where I think a feminist foreign policy is open to power and looks into power and how power can be influenced. And I think this is very interesting also with the opportunity Sweden has now in making a holistic policy, looking into the Security Council, looking into the EU, looking into different UN missions and, and all this, to influence this in parallel. Because what we have seen when we look into what is the difference that women make, and interestingly, most of the research looked into what have women contributed to gender and women provisions. And they have contributed a lot to this. But nobody looked into what else have they done because it was completely focused on women are there to look into women and gender uh, issues. What we found is that women as a collective group, when they were jointly together, they, they have more than any other group um, pushed for peace agreements to, to be signed, pushed for peace negotiations to be started, pushed for ending violence. And they have that proportionally done more than any other actor. And I think that's, that's quite striking. 
and they have also posed for gender. But I think it is also something yet to be studied more, the Gender Commission and the Colombian Peace Agreement. I think is, is much more easy to have an official commission that looks into gender mainstreaming as putting it all on the women, as if only the women are responsible for gender. What else did we find? We also find like whatever is there on, on women and what can they influence and how and all the nitty gritty details, how the selection criteria are done. I don't want to even bore you with all these thick details. Again, power. If the power relations in a situation of war and peace are not dealt with, if you take the national dialogue in Yemen that basically had a successful ending, was very inclusive, but the power players at the end didn't agree to ever implement the results. So have the actors involved internationally taken care enough of that? Difficult to say at hindsight, but I think if how do we, from a, let's say, gender focus in mediation, we also need to look into the peace process as such. There's no help if the peace process is wonderful, inclusive, and all the women and men are there, but there's no peace. So we need to, at the same time, look into the conditions that are there that makes mediation and peacemaking a successful endeavor. And this is what we often see in our policy work, that people who look into the gender focus are happy if there are only enough women and the gender representation is fine. Instead of looking, is the entire process on the right way? And what can we do, both with an, with an inclusive politics, to stabilize the whole thing? I think that's something where I think also gender expert needs much more work hand-in-hand -hand with mediation experts. Very briefly, uh, to finalize, what is it what this all means for practice? I think I mentioned it already. It's a more strategic, holistic approach to it. That, as you said, it's smart to have an inclusive politics. It's not just a normative obligation. I've seen, we have done, um, been invited to high-level mediation trainings by the UN. You talk to special envoys, and they all bought the message. I mean, at least they say so. <laughs> but you will not find a special envoy who says, like, this is, this is not important. But they all struggle with like how to really do it in a smart way. And they struggle with, I have to bring a peace agreement. And, and you were very right to say, like, it's not just a mediator. But interestingly, it's often still seen as this, this person. It's all in his, his hands. And um, we have seen also, like, there's a discussion going on. Should there be more female mediators? Of course, I think that's a given. But you talk to the UN, they say it's the member states not, not giving us enough females. And, the, and then the member states say the UN is not appointing. Instead of saying like what we have seen in our research, teams of mediators have been much more effective than this one guy. So why not just saying there should be always a man and a woman represented in the mission? UN says too hard to coordinate. You say like, well, I mean, how complex is peacemaking? You will be able to also coordinate a man and a woman leading a peace operation should be doable. So I think there's also another approach I would like to mention. There's a lot of investment in capacity building, which is on the one hand good. For example, if you take the Syria Women Advisory Body, it's the most trained women group on earth. They have on average every two weeks a training. By now, they know everything. Unfortunately, they're not sitting at the table and have any decision-making power. So it's, we have to also think about are these women getting the training they need? Do they need training at all? Are they not anyway very highly qualified women that brought them there at first? So very often, the international community is falling back in a project approach, because that's nice. You can give a project, you can monitor it, you can give money to it. Instead of saying, what's the strategic advice and push, which is much more unpleasant to think about how to engage the the UN in this, how to push for this end and that end, how to bring it all together. So I think there needs to be more courage in really going a little bit outside the comfort zone when we want to push this agenda and doing it in a, of course, diplomatic way, but being much more strategic and not just being strategic at first and then fall back to the operations of supporting only projects. And I think this is what I hope when we look in two, three years into the feminist foreign policy, that we can show, yes, Sweden is our standing example. And I tell you, they're all jealous already. 
in, in, in Norway, in Switzerland, in Canada. So let them be jealous. So I really encourage you to keep on going with this, both in research, and I think in research, this is my last point, you should really look more into showing the evidence in the nitty-gritty details of what works, what does not work, and not and combine qualitative and quantitative research, and not only crash the numbers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tanya Paffenholz, for a fascinating talk on women's influence, something that we we'll definitely need to do more work on also in regards to agency. Our last speaker is Professor Anne Towns uh, from Gothenburg University, uh, from the Department of Politics there. Uh, she's an international recognized scholar in the field uh, of international relations and particularly on women in international society. Professor Anne Towns is also leading a groundbreaking research project, a big one, uh, on gender and diplomacy at Gothenburg University. I've also had the privilege to co-edit a book on gendering diplomacy together with Anne, forthcoming this spring. Very excited that you are here and to hear you speak on your novel and groundbreaking research on the title Women Ambassadors in Global Diplomacy. All right, thank you. It is such an honor to be here, both at this laboratory occasion, but also in this distinguished company of the other panelists. I'm grateful to be here and to be able to talk to you a little bit about my research. So, I'm here to speak about some of what is a larger product, project on both on women in international society, gender in international society, but more specifically this new research project on diplomacy. Right. The focus of my talk will be on women, so I'm sorry, Joshua. I do work on men and masculinity also, but today I wanted to focus on women. And I wanted to think about women in diplomacy and to think about that in a global and a historical context. So what I'll give you is this really big and sweeping picture of women in diplomacy, just to play some of what we've heard in the kind of bigger context of what has happened over time and what's happening internationally and globally. I think to understand this, we have to think about and place women in diplomacy in the context of how states have changed, right? How the state has become a global entity, how it's developed, how it's changed, right? And how women, what kind of place women have taken in public office and in state office. And here, I think it's helpful to start thinking about the standard story about women and states in the world of women's political empowerment. Many, there are a lot of stories circulating thinking that for millennia, right, there's a tradition of patriarchy, that for millennia, for thousands of years, women have been shut out, shut out of politics and political office. This is a global kind of shared history, right? And then many think that then with the Enlightenment, Right, in the 1800s, 1900s, right, as the Enlightenment took hold, women in Europe, right, broke free of this first, maybe through some of the liberal reforms, right, and that women in the West then demanded political rights to the suffrage movements and so forth, so that women in, in the West were first liberated, and then this was to spread globally throughout the world. And that diplomacy then will be a part of this story of like a shared past of patriarchy, European women leading the way, right, breaking free from this, and then teaching other women around the world about their political rights. Let's see if I can make this work. What I have to say is shows quite a different story of this. So I would like to challenge the standard narrative, and I'd like to challenge you to think about both kind of the political history of women and the diplomatic history of women differently. Because if we take a look at all the research that exists in anthropological history, native history and so forth, the history of gender relations in Africa, Native America, right, and other parts of the world, we see that in the 18th and 19th century, right, there was not a world that shared kind of a patriarchal oppression of women in politics. 
Instead, we saw all kinds of different types of gender arrangements, right? that there was a diversity. We saw multiple kinds of political organizations, and those in turn rested on a variety of gender arrangements. Right? That sometimes had exclusively male rule, but other times also included female political leadership. Strict matriarchal politi polic polities, in other words, polities in which title holders were ex exclusively female and political power exercised solely by women, that seems to have been very rare. I've never seen an instance of that, right? So we don't have any all-female kind of political systems. But what we have is a range from patriarchal male-only state or polities, right, to gender mixed or gender balanced systems. And that's quite different than saying that, you know, there's a shared global history of female exclusion. So let's take a really quick look at that. Again, this is very sweeping, right? But 18th and 19th century, we see a range of societies with gender-balanced polities, okay? So for instance, the monarchies of West Africa, Native American tribes, Austronesian societies in Asia, and more, rested on arrangements that often had dual stool systems. So for each political office or each public office, there would be one female and one male stool. Okay, so it would be a shared arrangement. And some of these societies furthermore had flexible gender arrangements so that women could take on a male role, right? You could be a male daughter or a male woman. And that way you could also move into the male sphere of politics. Then we had a range of societies that were gender mixed, but male dominated, right? Some of these are in the monarchies of East Africa, present day Kenya, Zambia, but also some in West Africa. Okay? In these societies, majority of the, of the political office were held by men, but there were also women involved in politics. Then we have right, what we assume to be universal, the male dominated, right? societies with very few men, women. These include the larger empires, China, Korea, Persia, Ottoman Empire, right? These are the big powerful empires. Here, women did not often hold public office, right? So here, and these societies obviously also have a history, right? So it's a reason we came to this. But by the 18th and 19th centuries, they were largely male dominated. So then the question of course is, what was the situation in Europe? Europe during this time, we can see, was restrictive for women, right, during absolutism. This is when, right, the mon it's really the monarchies of Europe, when all power was vested in the sovereign, the king or queen. They were restrictive, but they were not uniform. There was no standardized kind of expectations for male, men and women in politics in Europe at this time either. We had some countries that had male preference succession, Right? But queen regions were allowed as exceptions. Right? So we saw in England and Scotland, for instance, the Habsburg Empire, Monaco, Russia, Spain, we had female queens at a time when all state power was vested in the sovereign. Right? So this, was not, this is not just symbolics. Right? This was actual power. Then we had other countries in Europe that had all male succession with no queen regions allowed at all. Right? They rest on a different tradition that was a sense of no separation of the physical body of the king and the actual state, reproduction of the state went through male semen and so forth. Very different tradition, right? resting on Salic law and so forth. At this time, diplomacy was not an all male sphere. And this is important to remember because this is about diplomacy. Right? So at the, during this period, ties to the royal courts were pivotal for diplomatic credentials. So diplomatic interactions among elites took place in networks of both men and women. Right? So in this context, women of the high European nobility could exercise diplomatic influence and they carried out many diplomatic tasks. They were trained in letter writing for official documents. They were trained to give speeches to foreign officials and so forth. So there were a range of women with relations to the courts that were involved in foreign relations and, and that served important diplomatic functions throughout the 17th and 18th century. Right? Women, as one of my colleagues has shown, f filled similar function also in the Ottoman Empire. And there were even occasionally women that were appointed as ambassadors during this period. 
So what we have then that is a history that's much more heterogeneous and complex. We don't have a history. We need to complicate this, right? It's not a history of shared kind of patriarchal oppression where women had no role in, in diplomacy, but a history where there was room for women in politics in some societies and in the European system where women did have a role in diplomacy. Not equal, but they were there, okay? Then something happened, right? 19th century. Then we saw a shift to male political rule, and that shift then became global, right? In Europe, this was the time when we had the big democratic breakthroughs, right? The state turned into the constitutional state. It was no longer just focused on kings and so forth, right? And with that came the exclusion of women, okay? So as, paradoxically perhaps, as states became more democratic and more open to the public, they also became less accessible for women, right? So what we saw was in Europe during the 19th century, er, just a wave of explicit and full-scale bans on the particip participation of women in politics or from holding public office, right? So we saw all these new laws developing. Second, so what we came to was then a standardized situation in Europe, which all European states said, no, women may not participate as voters, they can't hold public office and so forth, and this was enshrined in law. At the same time, this was the era, right, where European colonialism was, it was intensifying. Europe was acquiring new territories, right, in Africa, they were acquiring new territories in Asia, right, so the impact, of course, in these societies where women had, had shared, <laughs> that women had shared political office was devastating, right? So there was a reorganization then of political, <laughs> political office in colonized areas, which was severe, right? It was a fundamental restructuring of political authority as male. So, in other words, all the women that had power were sidelined in the new colonial administrative systems and men were put in place, right, in their stead. During the same period, we see similar shifts in diplomacy. This is when the modern ministries for foreign affairs developed, right, with the, where you had professionalized foreign service officials. With that development, women were squeezed out also from foreign service. So women lost much of their former influence in diplomacy. So instead we saw all male diplomatic interactions. Women served primarily as diplomatic wives, right? Carrying out important functions, but they were unpaid and they were seen as peripheral. After that, we have the 20th century, which I'm sure you're all aware of, was the century of the global struggles for women's inclusion or re-inclusion, as I would like to call it in some cases, right? This is where we had the huge transnational suffrage movements. We had fights for women, right, to be included in political office and so forth. And interesting here, as women gained access to state power in the early 20th century, there were often three exceptions, right? It was the military, which Joshua has talked about, priesthood, and diplomacy. Those were the three things that women could not join. These were institutions that were much more resistant, much more slow to open up to women, right? So Corinne and I, in our forthcoming book, we're trying to show some of this history, trying to piece together, like, when did diplomacy change, really, and open up to women? And you can see that in the 1920s to, through the 1950s is when the ban on women's entry into foreign service was lifted. And here Sweden was relatively late. We opened the doors to women in 1948, so we were not in the forefront of this development. After the ban was lifted, there was still a ban on women in many, in many countries from being married and serving as a diplomat at the same time, the so-called marriage ban. That was not lifted until the 1970s. That's, a, that's late, right? So you had to choose between a career or a marriage. Right? That then was lifted, and then late compared to a lot of other public office, we see in the 2000s, we see the number of women rapidly increasing and very rapidly so in some countries, right? Sweden has now 56%, I think, women in, or, of the workers in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs are women, right? So we have a majority, a female majority MFA, right? But there are a number of other states too that have seen a rapid increase, right, in women in the last two or three decades. So the question that I'm asking then is, what does the situation look like today, right, for women in diplo diplomacy? We don't really know. And that's what my project is about, and I have recruited a few colleagues 
that work with me on this. And one dimension of this is the simple mapping, right? So we asked the same question that Foreign Minister Wallström just posed before. Where are the women in diplomacy? Right? They're in, but where do they end up? Right? So together with a colleague at Gothenburg, we started, we started with ambassadors, right? just to get a, get a sense. Started a database. We only have 2014 so far. We've coded 7,000 ambassador appointments to get a sense of how many ambassadors are female and male, where are they posted, and so forth. I thought I'd show you a little of that. So in 2014, we're still only at 15% female ambassador, and this is the apex of a diplomatic career, right? This is the finest position one can reach. So it's still just 15%, but as we can see, it varies a great deal between regions, right? The Nordic countries, not surprisingly, are at the top, right? It varies among the Nordic countries. Sweden have a few... I think we're closer to 40% now, maybe. Denmark is lagging a little behind. Asia, only 10% female ambassadors sent from Asia. Varies a lot there, too. The Philippines has almost 30% female ambassadors. South America, same variation, 16% average. Colombia has, I think, 28% female ambassadors. So there's a great deal of variation within the regions, but we can also see regional differences here. Europe, if we with the exception of the Nordic countries, not doing so great. Right? Europeans are not really the role model in this respect. Right? They're, not, they're slightly below average, in fact. Then the next question we're asking is, where do women end up then? Now, we know they're here, right? but where do they end up? Do they end up in ambassador positions of power and prestige, or do they end up in the less prestigious ambassador positions and postings? Right? So that's also a question that together with Birgitta Niklasson, colleague at Gothenburg, that we've asked. So by status then, what does that mean? Of course, that varies a bit country to country. I mean, some countries might consider a certain posting very prestigious, whereas others might not. A neighboring country, a trade intense, and so forth. But we did just a simple look at GDP rank. In other words, how important, how big is the economy, and how big is your military, right? Just to get a sense of what are the economically and the militarily most powerful countries to see, do women end up at the same rate in those postings, or are postings like Washington, D.C., Moscow, and so forth, all male, right? The answer to this is that, by and large, it seems that female ambassadors have the same chances as men overall, right? So not huge differences, but they are... I, mean, I don't know if you can see these, these pictures or the tables. They are underrepresented in the most prestigious positions. So what we did here is we divided right, the 50, the top 50 countries, to, divided them into groups of five, and then we wanted to see right, the representation of male and female ambassadors in each grouping. And what we can see here is that group one, those are the most prestigious postings, so the highest military rank and the highest economic rank. In that particular group, we see that women are underrepresented as ambassadors, which suggests right, that there's some sort of glass ceiling still, perhaps. Right? That still the very kind of the core, most important arenas right, are still not as open to women. Sorry, it's because we see this in, as a consistent pattern. We turn and twisted this, this data in a number of different ways, and it comes out the same way each time. Right? So the next step for us, then, is to look more comparatively at specific states to try to explain variation. We're trying to look at this in different ways, right? Um, Sweden, for instance, has, for some reason, even though there's so many women in the Swedish Foreign Service, we have a much stronger pattern, right? So it seems like there's bigger differences between where men and women end up in the Swedish MFA than it is in other states. And we're curious about why that is, given that we know that we have leadership that's committed and has been committed to gender equality for some time, right? So there might be other mechanisms at work here. Then... Next, I'm just going to end with questions for you to ponder, because the next, I mean, the final, what we're, where I'm going next with the project as a whole is to think about gender, right, and feminist foreign policy in diplomatic interactions. I'm very interested in kind of the state-to-state -state interactions when state representatives meet, right? What are the gender dynamics of those? 
So for instance, what has happened to diplomacy? The mundane, the everyday, the routine interactions between st state representatives of different countries as women join in increasingly large numbers. Right? We know this is a masculinized space. It's not militarized masculinity, but it's masculinized. It's, had, it's been male only for well over 100 years. What happens when you add women to that mixed? Right? We know there can be trouble, right? We know there's been all sorts of trouble around dress, for instance, whether you cover your hair or not when you go to Iran with the female, females on your delegation, right? We know the Iranian diplomat that was in Germany, right? She was caught shaking hands with her German counterpart. It was a picture back, back home in Iran that was an outcry. They were shaking hands, right, with a man, presumably. Then it turned out the person she was shaking hands with was not a man. It was a woman that the Iranians thought was a man. So this is all, it, it's interesting in many layers, right? But then there are other, I mean, there are ways in which you establish networks, connections, male connections, right? How golfing, grabbing a beer at a bar, meeting at a sauna, what have you, right? Dress and behavior, right? So what do these, what are these are masculinized institutions? How do they affect women's ability to be effective, right, as diplomats? Another, and I'll wrap up with this, final or question that we're interested in is, takes us a starting point, this increasing polarization around the gender issues that we're seeing, right? There's a worrying development in which Pol in Poland, Hungary, Russia, right, and the populist right forces in the rest of Europe and North America, they're resistant now, they're resisting feminism. Even the term gender itself is seen as something terrible, right? So in that context, right, how do Swedish diplomats or other diplomats who are trying to promote gender equality, promote a feminist foreign policy in these very hostile environments? How do you frame and adapt a message for it to be effective? And how do you do that when there are stories circulating that we're the rape capital of the world, right? How do you initiate? How do you negotiate? How do you reach an audience in that kind of context? It's another set of questions that we're asking. And I think I'll end it at that since I have time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ann Towns, for providing us also with a historical overview, because that's highly essential, I would say, when we try to grapple on inclusion, exclusion, and how it actually fluctuates over time. So I would like to invite up all the uh, great speakers here for a conversation around the issues. There's so many of them, of course, we can't relate to all of them. We try to address uh, some of them. Um, so if the foreign minister sits here, Joshua, um, Tanya. Um, I will ask some questions, but you will also have the opportunity to raise a few questions in the end. And uh, we will see, uh, I see that we have some 20 minutes to go for that. So that's wonderful. Uh, thank you all for providing a fascinating in uh, insights. Uh, it's such a privilege to hear actually from the inside, to hear about policy recommendations, to get the stereotypes uh, challenging the essentialist assumption on gender and the historical accounts. Uh, but I would like to go out first uh, to ask the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Wallström, about actually picking up on what uh, Anne was saying in the end of her lecture, the polarization that we see presently. Uh, and the challenges uh, in the international arena for multilateral institutions such as diplomacy, where now Sweden is in the Security Council. So what do you perceive as being the major sort of challenges, but also opportunities in the Security Council? Sweden has now two years to actually uh, trying to push some of these great concerns on, on gender equality. What are the opportunities and restraints here that you see, particularly relate to the S Security Council? The overall challenges of today, I think, have to do with um, uh, pushing back uh, populism, polarization, um, protectionism, mm. uh, arguing for multilateral solution, for peaceful solutions. Uh, because we see also a militarization that is going on very rapidly, where they seriously consider introducing more nuclear weapons uh, as if that was uh, a, a solution to any, any problem. 
So I think this is for all of us to, uh, to consider and uh, also to continue to fight for democracy and human rights because this is also a, a tightening space for and shrinking space for, for human rights defenders and, uh, and those who argue for democracy. So, so that's, that's the overall task yes, we are yeah. given at the moment. Yes. And would you see? And also I would say, fight for science <laughs> and scientific yeah. uh, uh, evidence to to uh, as a base for the decisions that we make. And uh, this has been true for quite some time when it comes to climate change. But it is is more evident than ever that we have that challenge as well. Yes. And what would you say in regards to coalition building on like Sweden is taking the lead role here when it comes particularly framing feminist foreign policy, but what do you see as the opportunities of sort of building coalitions and mobilization on, on, on this platform? I have seen a huge interest uh, knowing more about what it is and how we work uh, with a feminist foreign policy. And I can see that countries like Canada and others are trying to follow and of course turn it into their own um, policy making processes. And um, and um, it's politically correct <laughs> today, but then we have to go behind and also make it a matter of, to me, it's also a matter of democracy. How can you ignore sort of consistently half the population, not let them in, not let them be represented? So to me, it's not that much about sort of whether we are the one or the other sort of feminist, but, but really it's also a matter of, of democracy. And and it's rational, it's uh, sound politics. Uh, and uh, that's why I try to, try to avoid this becoming a sort of ready set of, of uh, political views on everything or solutions. It's rather the approach. It's an analysis and it's the, uh, the approach and the instruments that you use. So that's why I turned it into sort of the three or the four R's that we have to use. And they, they work well, I have to say. They work as a, as a, a proper instrument uh, in, in everything we do still. Thank you. Uh, Professor Joshua Gerstein, I would like to probe a little bit about masculinity and focusing more also on peace negotiations. Uh, there's actually in the literature some arguments about the expression of hyper-masculinity that we can see in peace negotiations. How would you sort of unpack that rather abstract notion of hypermasculinity as being expressed in peace negotiations? And why I ask this question only to give the background is, and that will lead over to Tanya then later on, of how we can rethink peace diplomacy, rethink peace negotiations. So what are we seeing in the peace negotiations that are most of the time elite-based, and, and primarily conducted by men, so and expressing some kind of hypermasculinity. What is your reading on of this? Well, the the, uh, the the idea of having all men in a setting. It's not just that you're letting out, letting off half the people who could be contributing. There's more to it than that because the all male setting. That's traditionally the military kind of venue back through history. And it's the male status hierarchy setting. So you're, you've got a lot of baggage on that, that room full of men that when you add women into the mix, um, it's not just diversity, but you're breaking up that picture, which I think is very important. So in the all male um, status hierarchy forms of diplomacy, I think you're, you're leaning towards a more militarized view of diplomacy and you're leaning towards a more of a intermale competition um, and, and to the extent that we break that up and become more practical about what are the issues, what are the problems, um, not just for women, but uh, in general, what are the problems and then you can address those in a more rounded way with a more diverse uh, participants. Interesting. And as I was saying, Tanya, that's leading over to the question <clears throat> to you as well, because there's some arguments saying that peace negotiations generally is structural less. It's not very structured. 
as you indicated, it's informal. It's building on informal networks and influences are exercised in places, informal settings, as, for instance, secret negotiations. The question of transparency is not always there. So one of the major issues, I think, when we think about rethinking uh, peace diplomacy, addressing gender justice in peace diplomacy, is how can we redesign then the peace negotiations from being structureless towards more structured, inclusive peace negotiations? You indicated some tools, but I know that you have actually outlined a few modalities, very precise ones, of how this can be done. Yeah, but I think, uh, linking to what you just have said, it's also breaking this notion of there is this table with all the men and they are in power and they make all the decisions. It's not real. Anyway, as you said, there's a lot of sort of going on on the sidelines. And usually those who are sitting at the table are not the most powerful ones. The most powerful ones are the leaders back home. So often we even see this sort of break between those are there, but they might not even be the decision makers. So we have a lot of things, and I think the first thing is that a gender-based power analysis of understanding really what's going on, and then designing policies that open up and are more inclusive, especially, as you said, to break kind of the silo. What does this mean to be more inclusive? It means, I think, a holistic approach of both within delegations in the formal setting, and, simp and it's not enough to have a gender quota. You need to be also more young people. There's age that makes a huge difference. I've seen, like, I think uh, it was a long time ago in the Afghanistan negotiations, 2001, there was this one youth uh, activist, uh, female, and she made such a difference to really getting the people by, we are the youth, what are you doing to us? And you have these different expressions of people with different backgrounds from different constituencies. That's what the diversity is. It's really about diversity. That's inclusion. It's also not the right thing to see inclusion only as more women. Inclusion is really about the diversity and bringing everybody in. The democracy thing is, of course, having everybody also having the right to be there. Then it's, a, it's more or less a technical issue. There's very, diff very many options of how to do this, both with quotas, which work pretty well, actually, both with separate delegations, both with consultations that have real meaning and not are just sort of there to have the tick box. So it's really inclusion means a more inclusive set up of the talks, a process design that allows for this. I think that's, that's the most important thing. Yes. Can I just add, yes, absolutely. Can I just add one thing? Because we, still, we are still in the process of, or in a situation where a hundred countries around the world have legislation that makes it uh, more difficult for women to enter into the labor market. Mm -hmm. And the World Bank did such a survey and uh, all the members of the World Bank uh, were looked at or surveyed for this. And uh, for example, in Russia, there are 456 professions where women are not allowed uh, in, um, for example, to drive trains. Uh, uh, but even in France, uh, there are a number of, uh, of uh, laws that, um, or there are a number of professions that women... So there, there is still so much, it's not just a matter of how we, you know, a gender approach from the point of view of, of fairness or democracy, but it's yes. real yes. discrimination that is still happening, including in, in Europe. And so it has to start with with lots of these things to, to get rid of them uh, as well. And then, uh, then I think, yeah, well, I, I have lots of questions. Let, also let me to just add to <laughs> this, because I think we, what we found in our civil society in this broader research was really, it's not just about how these groups perform, how inclusive the setup is, but really also, like, as you said, how is the legal situation, how is this environment that allows it for things to happen? And then you have to kind of help this environment. So it's this, this holistic approach. But I would like to add something on these stereotypes, because this is an observation I have from the practical work I do, is that, for example, there's this, like, you cannot send a female ambassador or a female envoy to the Middle East. Oh, it's not possible, you know, in this male conversation. My experience is the contrary. It is like male have a men have a particular, probably trained, as I'm not a gender expert, kind of way of how they behave with each other in a power way. 
they have a power game. If you send a male envoy, a male ambassador, he cannot help but be part of that game. If you send a woman, they're all like, what is this? There's nobody to play. Um, but there's somebody to respect, because this woman has a formal position, and we have to accept this formal position. So I see females in highly patriarchic societies much more easier uh, doing the job, because you are out of this. First, the second thing is you have access. I mean, the first thing I do when I go on a mission, I go to the hairdresser. Everybody thinks I'm crazy, but this is the most valid information you get. And you choose the hairdresser right. Do you want to talk to the elites? Do you want to talk to the grassroots? You choose the hairdresser. And then you know what is the conversation. I come back with a very different sort of set of intelligence gathering as compared to the others. So there is also something that is different. And I'm also a fan of acknowledging that there is a difference when I come into a setting and, and say I'm a mother in an African setting. Well, I have a very different standing. Mm. And of course, I'm a father means the same, but the society is not ready to accept that. But I find it very fair to play with these roles as long we are not all equal. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we can tackle the question of inclusion and exclusion from a variety of perspective. And I would also say that even though we are celebrating Lund University 350 years, we have to remember also that it took another more than 200 years before women could join uh, Lund University in the late 19th century. So we need to keep that in mind and to have that kind of historical perspective that also Anne provided us with. But I would like only to pick up and, uh, and if you could also maybe reflect a little bit more on this. We have talked about power and influence, positions and hierarchies and I know that you have worked a lot on that. But are there, have you found in your work a correlation here? We saw that for instance on the Middle East very few ambassadors are there reciprocation on part, for instance, that also countries that actually are doing quite well on gender equality in the foreign ministries tend are not inclined to send a female ambassador to regions like Asia and the Middle East because they don't simply see it as a, a, a women-friendly diplomatic environment. Have mm -hmm. you seen any patterns of that Th in your There world. is some of that, yes. So the sending patterns and the receiving patterns are fairly similar, with the exception, I would say, of the United States. So the US sends quite a few ambassadors and female, uh, female ambassadors and female diplomats, but they don't receive very many. Mm. And I think that, should, that tells us something, mm. right? That it's not, yes, the gender equality issue matters, but the power and prestige of the place matters as well, right? So I don't think that it's difficult for a woman to be effective in, in D.C. I mean, the U.S. is a place where women can work quite well. There are all kinds of women in professional positions, right? But, but there are not that many female ambassadors there, and that's an important thing. I, but I think it can be sometimes a bit misleading when you look at um, how to categorize the most powerful or militarily or economically most powerful countries because I have to pay homage to my predecessor because uh, he actually appointed only women to the, uh, some of the uh, Eastern partnership countries and to Russia and to those countries that normally would not have uh, women ambassadors. And he did it consistently and really appointed women to this board. And they would not end up uh, on your sort of most powerful or most interesting list. But, but that was uh, a conscious move and a very, very good decision. And uh, today we, we don't hesitate to send women anywhere because they are, of course, bound, these countries are bound by conventions that regulate also the status of, of diplomats. But, mm -hmm. So it can be a bit misleading and it's changing ma ma material because, you know, after a couple of years they have to rotate so it can change very quickly also mm -hmm. how many female ambassadors we have, for example. And we've seen now that many choose to send women here because they know it's a good environment also for women in the Nordic countries, mm -hmm. uh, or they simply make it an experiment and to learn also from, from what we are doing. So it's a, um, yeah, it's a bit tricky no, uh, sometimes. And everything that we're looking at, I mean, it, like I said, I, I realize that we're not telling the full story, but, but, right, so there are countries that are doing a lot, like Sweden, but then there are countries also from the 
interviews we've done so far where I think they do take more consideration of is this a safe place for women, right? So sure. in Turkey, for instance, sure. we've talked to people at the ministry there and th they do have a list of countries that, that they don't consider safe for female ambassadors, for instance, or female diplomats. So I think it varies a bit. But yeah. if I could just add something also about the issue of stere gender stereotypes, I think there's something so interesting about di diplomacy and gender stereotypes because, you of course, you have a militarized masculinity which would seem to preclude women, right? Like we are not coded as beings that are aggressive and strong and all whatever, all the things you need to be. But di diplomacy, right, seems to be coded and all the ways they're typically female, right? It's about peace and speaking and listening and interactions, things that women are supposedly good at, right? It's about impeccable dress, Gossip is necessary, is central, right? Receptions and food and cookie trays, and uh, these are stereotypes, but still, if we're moving in the realm of stereotypes, I, that's a puzzle to me. I don't understand why diplomacy is not filled with women, because di diplomats or diplomacy is supposedly about the things that women are good at and what they do. So. But it's changing. Quickly. It is changing. I mean, it's changing fast. We don't have so much time, and Joshua, you, we will, I will allow everybody to respond uh, afterwards, but I would like also to invite actually the, the audience here, and I, we uh, will allow for three questions to be raised, and then the uh, great uh, uh, panel here <laughs> will be able to respond. So uh, we have uh, one question there, and one here, and another one further down. So uh, if you raise your arm, the first one that I pointed at? Okay. And please uh, say your name and who you are. My name is Ana Maria Vargas, and I am the research director of the Swedish Insti uh, Center for Local Democracy. And I have a question. <laughs> and the question uh, starts with a quote from The Guardian, and that is related to the country I come from, which is Colombia, which seems to be on the agenda of how peace is coming, and perhaps how the world is becoming a better place for Colombians. And the quote said, uh, from two weeks ago, Peace has proven more dangerous than war for activists and local leaders in Colombia because 110 leaders, local activists, have been murdered in the last year after the ceasefire. So, my question is, how does gender diplomacy, which for me seems like so elevated and close to like going to this fancy environment of, uh, I don't know, important people, links to these local leaders, to these local ambassadors that are fighting on the walk, the peace in countries like Colombia, and who are afraid of being murdered. Thank you. Thank you. And then we had one question here. I will take three of them in a row, and then we will be able to pick and choose in the panel which one you want to respond to. Um, my name is Mohammed from the Gaza Strip. I have a question to Minister Wallström. Um, by the end of 2015, you became a popular icon in my country, both for the Palestinian Authority and even for Hamas people, when you addressed the futureless prospect facing and despairing the young people few months after Sweden recognized Palestine officially and advanced the diplomatic level or relations. Do, looking at the situation now, entire hopelessness, utter failure in the French initiative, the last hope to revive the situation or give it a push. What do you think could be a real breakthrough the situation? And being um, Sweden as the head of the Security Council in the United Nations, what could Sweden provide for the Palestinian people at the moment? Could it advance its um, political activities in the Palestinian occupied territories and do you think there is a prospect ever to be to advance a feminist agenda in places like the Gaza Strip? Thank you very much. Thank you and I had a one last question down there so we get the microphone. There. Hi um, my name is Rahel from the Department of Political Science. Uh, for Joshua you were uh, emphasizing the uh, 
male status hierarchy with militaries, and I believe this is not something uh, universal. Um, as you probably know, a lot of uh, women participated in various liberation uh, movements, uh, decolonization movements in uh, Africa, and we have some more uh, contemporary situations like women participating in the military in the Peshmerga, and as well as Yazidi women uh, par participating in violence uh, in terms of resistance. I'm afraid that um, you know when we uh, sort of stereotype we have these gender stereotypes of women being uh, peaceful and what have you, or being able to engage in diplomacy. We're forgetting that women are also agents of violence, and especially in the form of resistance. So my question is a bit general to all of you. How can a feminist foreign policy take into consideration women's right to resist and therefore be violent, especially if patriarchy um, only responds to violence? Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we can't uh, take any more questions, but as you see, we are opening up Pandora's box, lots of questions, and we could actually continue here for hours on uh, discussing these issues. But I will allow the, the panel here to, to respond. Uh, you got respond some, and we make the other way around. So Anne, would you no, like to I'll, go out I'll first? I'll see it. I think the others are better at answering these questions. Okay, uh. thank you. So Tanya. I think he, he had talked less because we were too yes. many women on the panel. <laughs> 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 let's, let's give the minority a chance. Well, uh, this question about women in uh, the history of combat is very good, and I have an entire talk about that history, um, which I would love to come back to Lund anytime, and, and we'll talk just about that. Um, and uh, well, everything you say is completely true. Um, women are uh, very good at fighting in, on those occasions when they've been drawn into combat, often in uh, guerrilla and militia situations, occasionally in state armies. Um, it leads me to something I wanted to tie in that we were talking about earlier, which is that uh, oftentimes women who break into a traditional male sphere, and specifically the military, are successful if they're good at what they do. And you find um, uh, a remarkable woman um, like Lozen with the Apaches, you know, she'd go out with the war parties and then uh, somebody would be asked, you know, do women ever go with the war parties? No, they don't. Well, what about Lozen? Oh, well, she could shoot, you know, she was good at that. So when women, and it's probably the same thing with the t diplomats, you know, if you go to the Middle East country, if you're good, if you're getting the job done, it's going to work. Um, and, and so um, there's a, a practicality aspect to this that I think is very important, that you don't always have to come straight on with the democracy and justice angle, but it's what you talked about being smart. You know, this is smart, you know. Um, we can do better, we can get better outcomes uh, by taking gender into account. Some of the most impressive work I've seen was the uh, Gender Force Project here in Sweden, Harlet Isaksson uh, in the Defense mm -hmm. Ministry and then at, at NATO, and it was so practical. It was like, you know, how do you better design a chemical warfare decontamination <coughs> tent if you think about gender. How do you build a bridge better? Uh, and so forth. So, and I had a, a marine captain here, uh, a man who was a gender advisor, tell me, if you want to talk to the military about gender, don't talk about justice and rights. Talk about operational effectiveness and force <coughs> protection. And then a few years later, I was talking with a, a big room of Norwegian military officers, almost all men, and, and they said, what's this thing about gender? This is a paraphrase, you know, what, that our political leaders want us to understand. And I said, oh, you need to understand gender so that when you get to Afghanistan, you don't get blown up. And they go, hmm, good idea. And then a guy at the back of the room said, I'm about to deploy to Afghanistan to a provincial reconstruction team, and there are no women on my, on my team. Do you think that's a problem? And, and should I add some women? And I said, hmm, good idea. You know, so just the practicality of it sometimes um, again, breaks up the discourses that sometimes get so stuck. Maybe so. To, add, uh, yeah. to add on that, I think the, the, the problem we see also from research is not that there are women are often underrepresented, especially in resistance struggle. The problem is what happens after the peace deal. And that's what we see now in most countries, that women are pushed back and they are not the ones that are integrated in the national army that is formed. They are not the ones that sort of getting the bigger jobs. So they are fighting, but then they are pushed back to sort of their normal role. And this is, this is I think, something that, that is already addressed in like what of gender sensitive uh, demobilization programs and alike. But it's still, the record is, is pretty low. Also, when you think, 
how war changes gender roles, that you have more female-headed households, and then the men come back, and everybody is confused about roles in this. And, there's oft and then we have this typical increase, statistically, in much more uh, household and, and gender-based violence after the, the peace agreement. And that links to the question about what are sort of the, the, the local level uh, peace leaders. And I think there's, our research shows basically two things to it. One is there is much more consciousness at the moment in terms of the sort of high-level diplomacy to integrate and include. At, le at least there's a lot of lip service about it. But then you see some countries, especially Colombia, as you know, there have been consultations during the FARC, uh, uh, negotiations and with the ELN process, the second largest uh, armed group, there's uh, a lot of push towards more participation of different strata of society. The question is how is that managed and how are the results of those sort of far away consultations being brought up sort of to, to the top? And this is a two way. So on the one hand, where we see that movements on the ground push for their inclusion and push for it, this is, of course, meeting then if there is a push from the top as well. So the two have to meet. But there's also other examples, and I think um, when you think about Lema Gama's movement in Liberia, they were the grassroots women that were then invited to come to the talks, and they said no, because they said, we're going to be co-opted. We don't want to be part. So sometimes it's also when, when, when we work with um, movements and civil society organizations, we have to really see like what is the best strategy with the best outcome because sometimes resistance and pushing outside of, for example, formal talks is equally important as being inside. But the other thing is, and that's the other research we have done, is that there's a lot of good things going on sometimes on the local level which can be sustained over time even if the official process breaks down. And sometimes there's even no need to link it all up because linking also always means cooptation. And we want to also safeguard and parallel these sort of positive developments on the ground. What happens often is how to sustain them when there is an official deal. Yes, thank you. Uh, Margot Wallström, Ma you had some specific questions here, yeah. and of course they are huge, so you can be selective. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there are two points to make about uh, women as uh, peacekeepers or women as, as fighters or um, soldiers. And uh, the first is that my starting point is that women should be allowed to choose. If they want to take on such a role, it, it should also be their, their choice to do so. Uh, and secondly, that's my starting point. Not that we are different from the beginning. I mean, most men have also had to be taught how to become a, a soldier. And we've, I have seen myself what happens also when men actually cannot fulfill the role that they are expected to play as warriors. Because uh, I saw it when it came to sexual violence in conflict, when, when they could not rape a woman, then they would uh, shoot her instead and, or do something else that uh, we should not even mention here at the moment. But uh, um, this, and, and women are also uh, warriors, but what they all say is they want to be seen as not only victims, but they want to be see, seen as agents of change in their own countries. They want to participate. And I think this is the most important thing. And of course, to do prevention as well, because this has to do with the role that women are given in a society. Everybody knows that they are also economic backbones of their society. They are the ones who who uh, grow something and sell it, they carry produce to the market, they do all of that. Uh, but when the husband has been killed in a war, they are not allowed to inherit the land that they have been taking care of. So this is the whole, you have to have a whole a holistic view on, on these issues. Um, and I think maybe just to say one thing about Colombia, it's a long way still to mm -hmm. peace and it's a very sensitive uh, situation right now where now at this moment uh, the FARC soldiers have come to the different camps between 20 and, and 30 different camps all around um, Colombia where they are handing over their weapons. So it's the, the demobilization uh, disarmament uh, process that has started. They are very vulnerable when they left their guns, of course, uh, their weapons there. 
uh, they are extremely vulnerable and uh, they expect also the promises that the government have given them to offer some alternative living uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be realized at this moment. And uh, still the violence against uh, all of those who fight for, for democracy and human rights and so on. And that, that has been an element uh, and a reality in, in Colombia for so long. And we still have to, to figure out how the international community can help to keep uh, people safe. And this has also been the most devastating effect. Um, uh, and, and especially, I must say, targeting women because they are very vulnerable in a situation like the one we've had in, and seen in Colombia for so long. And finally, uh, a word about Palestine and Gaza. In Gaza, it will not take long before the uh, drinking water, um, they are out of drinking water. They can no longer fish uh, or in a very limited area uh, uh, in the, outside the coast. Um, so they cannot actually create a living of, of their own. And the situation is also very, very uh, difficult. Um, and this can't go on. It has to change. And uh, we've asked, of course, for access to the project that we have paid for also in the Gaza Strip. Uh, very, very difficult to get the Israelis to accept that. But uh, the EU and, uh, and all the international community trying to assist and uh, to, to um, uh, change the situation in, in Gaza. With the Palestinians, we've also said that, you know, a person that is now 26 have only had a chance, one chance, to vote uh, if you're a Palestinian. You have to create a, a more democratic system involving young people. It's their future. Uh, and women. Um, so th this has to change also. And those are the reforms that the Palestinians themselves have to do. But also stop... Um, it's a fading vision, the two-state uh, solution right now. It's really um, just uh, uh, vanishing um, in front of our, our eyes at the moment um, with all the demolitions and the settlements uh, and, and all of those uh, things happening on the ground. So we, we can only continue to fight for, for a two-state solution because the alternative, nobody can see what is the alternative. And it will in any case mean probably more violence and and problems, and uh, that's why we, at least in the European Union and in the um, Security Council, argue for for uh, continue along the lines of a two-state solution. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as you can hear and see and have heard today, uh, we I think this uh, panel has provided a fantastic inspirational agenda for students to engage on future studies to engage on politics and we are very honored and privileged that we know that the foreign minister Wallström has a very hectic uh, time schedule but it, you take the time to discuss and engage with uh, Lund University in such a way it's a great privilege but also for the ones who have traveled far to come here and to talk about your research and to have this very stimulating discussion so join me in a warm applause to uh, the great speakers. <laughs> And I would also like to underline that this is only the start of the week, of this scientific week, or it's still on Tuesday. It's already set for another major flagship symposium this afternoon on Disaster Evermore. We have some of the panelists down here, so please join from three o'clock uh, and the exciting, stimulating discussions will continue. Thank you for coming. <laughs>